joined today by Roy Diblick, who is a recognized perennial plant expert and co-owner of the Northwind Perennial Farm in Burlington, Wisconsin. Northwind specializes in growing traditional and native plants that are used for creating sustainable plant communities, otherwise known as gardens. Roy has collaborated with other plantsmen, such as Dutch designer Pete Odoff, whom he worked with on the Lori Garden Project in Chicago. Though Roy may sometimes be a plantsman or a designer or even an author, he is always a gardener. He believes that every gardener, no matter their level, can grow a plant-driven and aesthetically beautiful garden. Over the past three decades, Roy has developed what he calls the No Maintenance Garden. In 2014, he published the book, The No Maintenance Perennial Garden, to share his knowledge and passion for his new approach to the garden. The No Maintenance Perennial Garden, which is spelled K-N-O-W, truly shows people who want to create a garden the importance of how plants interact with each other and form communities, and how that, in turn, can help reduce the risk of failure. Roy is also involved in promoting the profession he cares so deeply about. Roy has helped establish two new schools that will teach the fundamentals of gardening, as well as how to run a gardening business, giving people the opportunity to make a living at doing something they truly love. Recently, I reached out to Roy to see if he would share with us his passion for gardening and why we need more gardeners. Here is my conversation with Roy Diblick on gardening. My name is Stefan Van Norden, and this is Nature Revisited. It was a beautiful day here in New England. A great time of the year to be thinking about getting back outside and making plans for our gardens. And what makes up most of our gardens are plants. So Roy, after reading the preface of your book, The No Maintenance Perennial Garden, I was particularly struck when you said that, quote, plants share their own language and that we have either ignored or misread that language. Can you elaborate on that a bit? You know, there's so many living beings on Earth, and every living being has its own way of of relating and connecting to all other living beings. So I think for the longest time, we've come to know plants as either a food product, building product, or entertainment. So because we've come to I've come to see plants as entertainment, you know, I want you to look good here, I want you to feed me, I want you to build, provide my shelter and clothing. We've never come to understand who plants really are, how they live on Earth, and how they live in social communities, how they maintain their own balance on Earth, and how, even through our interactions a long, long time ago, we, we promoted their health and well-being simply by the way we harvested and collected them. And as we've changed our, our way of being around plants, we've simply not listened to them anymore. And if you don't do what I want you to do or expect you to do, and I want to put plants with you that I want to do more, and if I don't like what you're doing, what I will do is throw you in the compost bin because you're not performing the way I want you to perform. And when I think about living in life, I don't think there's any human beings I could do that with. So I think we've just not listened to what plants are saying to us and saying, look, here's how I've lived socially on earth in the conditions I've lived in and the plants I've shared life with. And maybe you could investigate as a human. How did it get to be that way for me? To be honest, I think I learned that from the folks at the Morton Arboretum in the 70s and 80s, from people like uh, Ray Schulenberg, Floyd Swink, and especially Jerry Wilhelm. 
Because their job, what they believed in, was save the remnant prairies. Because we'll never get prairies back the way they were. It's never going to happen. That's our past. But when we save the remnants, the remnant prairies are sharing consistently how they got to be who they are. So when you look at remnant prairies, look at the strength and the security they provide for each other as living beings. All you can think about is how how you can save them and learn from them. When did you first start connecting with plants and begin to see that they did have a life and a language of their own? When I, I never had a horticultural class. I don't have a horticultural background. My, I graduated a degree in outdoor education in the 70s, been an outdoor ed teacher. And I think that's when I started to discover that relationship that plants had on humans because I never saw that with adults. Usually adults were spraying plants, killing things. <laughs> But with kids, the kids had a different way of seeing nature. They were so curious and they questioned everything. And I think through their questioning, through looking at things like children again, I started to say, yeah, that is cool. How did that get that shape? And why would that shape relate to where we found it? And after I did more and more of that, it just started to become the way I started asking questions. The gas shortage hit the 50s and I was the first to go. The good programs, okay, we got to cancel the outdoor ed program for the kids. We can't afford that. Okay, cancel all the good stuff. And then I got a job at the St. Charles Park District taking care of their parks. So at the park district, I enjoyed taking care of the baseball fields and mowing and dumping trash barrels. And I I was outside. So what more could I ask? And then a little later, a guy bought a place called the Natural Garden that had 350 perennials in it, in the ground. So he asked me to run it because of, again, my work ethic, and I love being outside. I didn't know a perennial from a doorknob, but I learned every plant because they were in the ground. And when I dug it and put it in a beer box for 50 cents, every plant would share with me their root system, the root colors, how fast they would wilt when I dug them, how to prune them back so we could compensate for root loss. And a lot of the edu- education came from Mr. Stevens, who started it in 1953, and he would sit with me. So he would say, well, I cut that back. Don't dig so deep. You're given too much soil. So I learned from him, and I learned from the people that bought the plants. They were sharing with me their knowledge of gardening. It was, it was all gardeners love communicating with each other. So that's how I got started in 78, and I started growing native plants in 1979. I went to the Morton Arboretum and met Ray Schulenberg, and I couldn't believe when I saw the Schulenberg Prairie, why isn't this everywhere? And Ray said, people aren't ready for it, Roy. They're just not ready to understand native plants. And he was right. The ones I grew in 79 and 80, I gave them all away because nobody wanted to buy weeds. And eventually, people started recognizing their value. So through the 80s, it caught on. And by 1991, I was selling 350,000 native plants a year. So what are you doing now these days? Well, I I do the same thing I did in 1978. I'm still a grower. I left the natural garden in 91. We got too big. And I wanted to be, I wanted to be a plantsman. I didn't want to be a businessman. I love people, but I don't want to manage people. I want to grow plants. My friends and I, Colleen and Steve, we started Northwind up here in Lake Geneva in 1990. And I just hired four guys. And with four or five people, we grew 400,000 perennials a year. And then people started asking me to design native gardens around the mid-90s. And simply this one guy, he owned all the movie theaters here in the Lake Geneva area. And he was putting some condos up. And he said, Roy, I want you to design native gardens for me around my new condos. But there's one thing, Roy. I said, yeah, it has to look good. And I went home. I go, what did he mean by has to look good? I was very puzzled by what he meant. And simply I looked at the native gardens that were being planted and I... I started to understand what he meant. There was no composition. People were putting names in because they loved them, but they were randomly willy-nilly putting in big blue stem, Indian grass, kind of what was easy to grow, the easier to grow natives, which were the thugs and bullies. So what led you to write your book, The No Maintenance Perennial Garden? Well, I had a lot of people coming out. They wanted a garden they didn't have to take care of. And I said, well, I don't think there's anything that you've ever had or will ever have on earth that you don't have to take care of. You have to brush your teeth, wash your clothes, clean your eye. Everything has to be cared for. So I don't know of any garden that you could put in that you don't have to take care of. Because, and especially when you think about it, 
you're placing the plant, you're touching that plant and placing it, and you're you're putting it and placing it with other plants. So those plants have no choice where they live or who they live with. That's all a human. That's all a human practice. And because the plants never made a choice of where they live and who they live with, you have to be a gardener. You have to understand who you're putting them with and how they're going to grow into each other from youth to maturity. So when people kept asking me for something they didn't have to take care of, I realized when you do put plants together from youth to maturity and you understand how they relate to each other, basically how will they grow into each other from children to adults, that you can predetermine the labor based on their interactions with each other and their ability to collect light and share resources. So when you look at their ability to collect light, share resources, and how they grow into each other, and if they knit together tightly, you can suppress weeds too. So you can really manage your costs by understanding how each plant you touch and place and how you place plants with them will relate to each other. And that was why I wrote the book. I just wanted to express to people if the distinctions you start to make between each plant continue to rise, and that's with anything. The more distinctions you make between this and that, the more creative you get. So as your distinctions keep improving and rising and you keep making more and more distinctions between who the plants are and how they grow and live on Earth, your creativity level becomes becomes unstoppable, really. You can't you just won't stop. But if you don't have any distinction between this plant or that plant and they seem the same to you, you'll you'll never change it'll never change. You'll never have an understanding of how to be creative. Because you don't understand any difference between that plant and this plant, except maybe that it's has a blue flower or a red flower or a white flower. And that's not going to help you put a social system of plants together. That's just going to make you feel good for maybe 20 minutes, and then you'll get disappointed because the plants quit entertaining you and let you down. You say that your book is about a new way of gardening. How important is community when it comes to plants? Community is important to all living things. I mean, you look at everything, people. It's not just having a community. It's how you contribute to it. How do you, what's your role? And how do you love and live your within your community? That's the same with plants do. How does this plant interact with that plant? How does one plant seed into the open space another plant provides as they spread and go in, in different directions? How do they? It's all about interact. It's about relationships. So when you put your plants together, and you're creating a, a way of them to grow into each other in a in good relationships, as a gardener. You can walk through those relationships when you're hoeing in the spring with our, we use the Dutch bush pole hoe. And while you're hoeing in May to keep the initial weed population down because sunlight is hitting soil. And as long as sunlight hits soil, you'll have weed seed germination. But when you're hoeing through that garden, that gives you time to interact with the relationships. So it's not, you're not just hoeing, you're also looking at what relationships are taking place and what's changing within those relationships. And that's called gardening. And that's what a lot of people don't see because they don't they don't really know what gardening is. They know how to keep the world neat and tidy. I mean, a lot of landscapers are very, very good at keeping the world neat and tidy, but they don't they don't really look at gardening as a practice or as a profession. And that's why we see so many places look very sterile, and we see plants surrounded by uh, three to four foot centers surrounded by wood. And we and the poor daylily, we made the daylily and the Rebecca, we made those default landscapes because we didn't know what else to do. So you just put in two hundred daylilies. And I think we're we're going beyond that now. Like like Pete Aldo. He knows how to design, his designs are beautiful because he knows plants. He's been nursing them the majority of his life. So because he knows plants, he can put plants together in beautiful social systems of living. And they can be stunningly gorgeous. And what they do is they move people emotionally. Dan Pearson, he's he's the same way. Dan Pearson is a tremendously emotional designer. And he knows plants well. He's a very good plantsman. Laura Keistra from Lurie Garden. She is a, a wonderful designer. And her designs are so beautiful because she relates plants to what I'm learning about is all the insect and bird populations. So she can put beautiful gardens together, understanding how they relate to insect, not just insects for pollinators, but insects for lifestyles and living. So I, it's it, we're really in a, in a wonderful time right now where there's so many different ways of looking at plants, but they're all collectively going in the same direction. And I think that's where I see a plant-driven future. I think this is a good time for me to ask you about Hank Gerritsen and his book, the essay on gardening. 
How did he influence your approach to gardening? He and Pete put a book together, Planting the Natural Garden. I was so moved by that book that it wasn't perennials A to Z, but it was about how to put the plants in plant communities and plant relationships. It was grasses with perennials. It was just looking at all these different styles of planting, but creating good, solid relationships based on how the plants would live together. And when I saw that book, I realized this is a big change. And I think then Hank's book on his essay, when I bought that, I thought, wow, what a great book. Because it was like, I never, I met Hank at Pete's place. We talked briefly, and then he passed away suddenly a year or so later. Pete would invite all the knowledgeable gardeners in Holland to his place. And they would just talk to each other, drinking wine and eating at night. And I, I, when I went to that, I, I sat, I didn't say a word because I listened to everybody. Rob Leopold was there talking about his, his work with seeding in Holland and Hank, and there were so many other people. I can't remember, the, there's uh, two women that were just so knowledgeable about bulbs. They were like scary knowledgeable, and it was so wonderful. But that's how Pete learned, too. He would invite everybody over, let's have some food, and let's talk about what we do and share knowledge together. And I was so inspired by that. And, and that's kind of the relationship I was invited into at the Morton Arboretum. I didn't know everybody as deep friends, but they never said, don't come over, Roy. I could call Ray Schulenberg. I could just stop in and, and bring in some sedges. He would identify him for me while he was putting his coat on. And I thought, the guy's a wizard. And he would share with me who they live with and what's, what commun- plant communities and what savannas or woodland areas you would find that sedge and how you'd find them. And as long as I was interested in it, he always would share with me. And Jerry Wilhelm was the same way and still is the same way. And Pete and Hank's book was kind of that way. It was like sitting with Hank and listening to him describe his intimate moments, exploring his own world and his own way of being with plants. There are some things I can't do because I, I don't have the same growing conditions. But there are thought processes he had that I can try. And that's what I like so much about his book here. You're kind of watching him, listening to him or reading with him, how he would think a process through with his meadows. And that was so invaluable to me to kind of read, read his thoughts about what one step and the next step and the next step was. It's a great book. And now, speaking of books, your book, I mean, you really show the reader how to create a wonderful garden and a wonderful community of plants. You do it in a wonderful way that even the novice can understand the the details. And I think the the grids I used, it basically was to get people off to a good start. The grids are like a, it's like a cookbook. So I think if people get off to a good start creating a community, with the small grids that I prepared for them. And they can, in two or three years, they change it. They'll say, I want more yellow here. I need more texture here. And my hope is then they'll do things because they want to, not because they have to. And it would develop a joy in gardening because with the good start, you keep building on your successes. So that was the hope was to just get people off to a good start. See how much fun being in the garden is. A lot of times when I'm out in the garden, it gives me a chance to be my own best friend. You know, the plants aren't asking anything from me or they're, they're just saying, Roy, take take your time. We'll share some time together. So that was my hope is to get people off to a good start and then kind of share with them that some of the practices we've never questioned why in the world we put wood around plants. It's just something we never questioned. And then in 2003, I just started mowing everything to see what would happen if that would be successful. And the plants loved it. It's an endless activity of knowledge and learning and practicing. I think that's a key practicing um, and to move forward, which is very exciting for our future. You do it really well in your book. And and obviously that's where the title comes from, the No Maintenance Perennial Garden. It's It's a wonderful book. Let's change just a little bit because you live in Wisconsin. How did the prairie influence your overall understanding of the garden and the use of more native plants. The big influence on me was, I think, the diversity. When I realized, you know, when I, when you look at a square meter of prairie, and you see there's 
14 to 22 species per square meter, and that's healthy, you realize, why would I ever divide perennials and separate them and keep them three feet apart or two feet apart? When I saw that diversity and the plants living closely together, that intimacy they shared, I, my friend, well, how do I create that in a garden? And of course, I can't have that intermingled intimacy in a garden. It won't happen because it's a created environment. It's not plants seeding within each other over uh, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 years to take that kind of form. But it can inspire me to, to create intimacy. I think it was the colors, the soft texture, the, the moments of continuous color, spring through summer. And I think the quiet, when I would go out to the uh, remnant prairies or visit them, it's, it's just the quiet. The quiet is so stimulating. It's almost too loud in a way. It's too loud. It's so quiet, it's too loud. And when you, you hear the, the grass is starting to move, especially in uh, probably early September and the lianter is coming through it. So it's that interplay that I, I enjoy too. It's things coming through things, the patterns that creates and the stimulation that creates also. When I got introduced to prairie, every person that introduced me to it was crying from passion. So when you, when you see adults crying, and because of something beautiful, you get moved by that. How important is the prairie ecosystem, and why should we emulate it? Well, I think the important thing that prairie would show out, if you look at the remnants, of the most, I think to me the most important thing is always planting with diversity. Because I'm a gardener. I'm not an ecologist or restorationist. I have a degree in outdoor education. I'm not a knowledgeist of anything. And I look at myself as simply a gardener. When I look at horticulture historically, I look at uh, the art form of what we do. It's, it's something where people have loved and brought plants and, and were overly curious about plants. And that's how they became food products. And that's how they became clothing products. It was our curiosity. And then when I look at native plants, I look at all their possibilities. You know, people have done wonderful things for monarchs, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. So I incorporate, I'd say, more than 50, 60 percent of my total plants are native. But I also work in good solid perennials to give me aesthetics. I like beauty. I like, and that's why in my book I used impressionistic painters to create the, the grids from. And it wasn't to duplicate the painting, it was to get the, the blends of color tones off the painting that would inspire me to create the garden. I think of horticulture, I, I like to look at it as an art form. So, and you insist that you're a gardener, and, and you've said it a number of times, but just once again, kind of share with my listeners why that's important that you consider yourself a gardener. I'm looking at the plants in a cooperative relationship and to understand what their future is, what their future potential possibilities are when I lay the plants out and encourage them to go in that direction. And then change with dynamics, too. If there's some dynamics that take place that I wasn't prepared for, maybe maybe something seeded in or came on the wing of a bird. So I, I make decisions based on dynamics, make decisions based on the changing relationships and nature. And then I make decisions on aesthetics. Maybe I just want to get something blue in there that I haven't had in before. So I can take some things out and add blue. What's the competitive nature of what I put in that's blue? How long can I count on it uh, before it's shaded out by its neighbor and that's all oh, I got three years but I have to worry about it. And then I can make decisions to make changes to change the capacity of need for a gardener. I can change the patterns and that way I don't have to be as watchful because those patterns would live a more balanced way. But then maybe they wouldn't be as entertaining. They wouldn't be as aesthetically pleasing to somebody. And that's the cost of beauty. So why do you think we should garden? Wow, that's a good question. I think you, you got no choice, really, because you're human. And being a human being, we've been connected to the earth since we stood upright, even before that. So genetically, everybody wants to touch something, and we're all moved by everything around us. So I think it's just inherent that we have, we're not that far removed in our urban lifestyle that we just don't react to maybe a bird landing on a bush or a shrub or a we might see an earthworm after a rain on a sidewalk and pick it up and, and put it back on the lawn. So we do have empathy for other things. We're a loving species. And I think it's just in our nature to touch the earth and, and want everything to be healthy. But we've 
lost our way a little bit in our urban lifestyle. So I, I think it's just something we are bringing back into our way of being it is touching the earth. The garden is changing, the perennial garden, both privately and publicly. What role does the nursery play in the changing of the garden? I think nurseries have a tremendous role because they are introducing the plants to people. And the wonderful thing about nursery people is they're they're probably the, the biggest group that are held to accountability. Because no one can grow a plant that looks bad and sell it. So every grower, every nurseryman has to grow things that are healthy and beautiful. And sometimes that accountability doesn't hold true for landscapers and designers. But growers and nurserymen are held accountable for the, the health of their plants. So the nurserymen are, are, to me, the heart of the industry. What they grow, how they, how they share with people their knowledge of plants, the intimate knowledge they have of plants, and that's what gets everybody started. And when you buy a plant, like having a kid, you make a commitment. You know, you, you've got to care and love that plant. You know, the local nurseries can help people out with knowledge and, and show people how much they love what they do, too. That which is loved is beautiful, and that which is beautiful is loved. So do you see a new American garden developing from this new plant-driven approach? And what are some of the emotional and spiritual benefits from the no-maintenance garden? Well, I think they're subtle. I, th I think, you know, when you, because we're a lot of times, again, we're, are, we sometimes have a culture that runs on fear. A lot of times when you look at change, there's only one way I see change happening in people's lives, and that's through self-discovery. So I think when, when people are discovering on their own, maybe the joy of planting, or they share it with their children, or they see other families doing it, I see that being the change. Again, it's not going to be overnight. I think COVID, as sad as COVID was and still is, people found a way to touch the earth. And there were 5 million people bought plants that never really bought plants before. That's quite a few people. But I think in the overall, we're a very positive species that likes to care, nurture, and love things. And I think that's the positive of being a human being. So finally, let's talk about the work that you're doing at Cantini Park and the Yerke Observatory, how you're involved and how important they are. I agree with you. I think there's a real need and a future for gardeners. Now, the Europeans are a culture of gardeners. They, they've done it for centuries. It's part of their culture to, to garden and to understand relationships about gardens around their homes. And I think here what we're looking at is we understand our landscapes and we have an understanding of how they became how, what they are. They're kind of a, a minimalist look of a lot of mulch and a lot of, a lot of plants simply getting replaced too often. So when you look at the cost of that rising and rising, but nothing changing, I've been teaching a plant community class at COD for 12 years. It's, it's looking at plants and putting them in good relationships so they live well together and having knowledge of the plants so you have the capability to do that. I, 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 see, I see us moving in a good direction. I, I work with a lot of young people. They're, 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 see, they're seeing and understanding where the future is and, and seeing they can make a living doing a lot of things we couldn't make a living at doing before, especially being professional gardeners. We've created two schools of professional gardening here that I don't even know if they exist in America, where you can, not, not to become a professional gardener, to be just a public space person, but to be a professional gardener working for various contractors or starting your own business. Yerke's Observatory here in uh, Williams Bay was the home of astrophysics. It was purchased by people around Lake Geneva. And through Gateway College, we're going to start a professional school of gardening next year. So young people can come out of school with knowledge of plants, and they can either start their own business and they can earn a living, you know, making $25, $30 an hour. And with their knowledge, they can even reduce the cost of outdoor care per square foot. Because it's just, it's not just about throwing labor at stuff. It's about throwing knowledge at something and doing something with knowledge and awareness. And you can actually cut your per square foot cost because you put the plants in a position to be responsible for their own well-being. When you put the plants in that position to contribute to their own well-being, the cost to care for gardens declines a little bit. 
each time. And gardeners will know this. So I'm really excited about the School of Gardening. Two years ago, we had the idea, we talked to Cantini, which is a museum outside Chicago, and they have beautiful gardens, and they were getting a new master plan, and they said we could use some space to teach gardening to young people. So COD has a sustainable program, planting program. So within that program, we looked at having a two-year class all summer long. We, we're going to teach, we're going to look at putting plants together and how to care for them the first year. And then the second year is the best part. The students can see the consequence of their actions. You know, they can see, did I put these too close? And if they were closer, should I have spaced them or, do, or did I space them too far apart? So I think that second year is very important to, to see what happened with the actions they took. So those two years, I think, are vital to get that kind of uh, direction. And we're also going to have classes on how to start your own business because you don't just have to go work for somebody. But I think those are big steps to, to look at our future as that, back to that plant-driven future. We need gardeners. We need people of knowledge. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Roy Divlick. And if you want to learn more about Roy and his no-maintenance gardening, please visit northwindfarm.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please share with friends, family, and colleagues. You can follow Nature Revisited on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And of course, on our website, nordenproductions.com. If you are a follower of Nature Revisited, consider showing your support by rating and reviewing this podcast on your favorite podcast app. The music for this episode is Overpass by Ben Cosgrove from his album, The Trouble with Wilderness. Nature Revisited is produced by Stefan Van Norden and Charles Gagan. I hope you will join us for the next edition of Nature Revisited. And in the meantime, do remember, we are nature. Mm-hmm.